A first step in stabilising relations. The foreign ministers of Australia and China finally meet. But they haven't exactly kissed and made up. The fundamental differences remain. And this week, the Prime Minister will be trying to counter Beijing's influence in the Pacific. I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. After more than two years of trade sanctions and a diplomatic cold shoulder, the meeting on Friday between Penny Wong and Wang Yi was significant. Neither foreign minister made any immediate concessions, but they heard each other out. Both sides clearly want a more stable relationship. Now, that doesn't mean Australia will be shifting course. Anthony Albanese has been raising his concerns about China at the Quad and NATO summits in Jakarta and in Paris. This week, the Prime Minister heads to the Pacific Islands Forum, where again, China will be a major focus. The PM's busy global itinerary drew some criticism, though. Coalition frontbenchers accused him of ignoring flood victims as parts of New South Wales were deluged once again. It's coming round again. It's slowly creeping in. This is a two-storey property. These people had to be evacuated yesterday and the river has just completely swallowed it up. More heavy rain will target Sydney, the Illawarra and Blue Mountains today with totals of up to 200 millimetres. You just want to cry. You just want to pack up and walk away, but what can you do? My daughter lives on the corner there and her place is completely under. I'm not insured. I can't get insurance. It's gone up through the top of the doors, basically. Pretty much everything will be gone. The sort of people in town losing their livelihoods is heartbreak. It's heartbreak. Are you concerned about the optics of him not being here while there's a flood? This hadn't happened before he left and, you know, uh, the Prime Minister has been in a war zone. It's up to Mr Albanese to explain to the flood victims what he's doing for them. But it is important that constituents know people are on the job. We hadn't heard from Anthony Albanese for 48 hours. I have not had a day off for a very long period of time. I've got news for him. Prime Ministers don't get days off. The Prime Minister has toured the New South Wales flood zone, taking in the devastation and announcing millions of dollars in financial support. It doesn't get any easier, even though we've been through it so many times. The aim, of course, is to get this money into people's pockets as quickly as possible. The Prime Minister continues to cop flack for being too late in getting here. The federal government needs to balance international concerns and domestic concerns. If his political enemies are trying to draw a line to Scott Morrison's infamous Hawaiian holiday during the Black Summer bushfires, Mr Albanese is having none of it. To compare that with a holiday is, I just find, beyond contempt, frankly. Your government and your government need to start working together. You've had flood studies since 2012, but we nothing's happened. Someone should actually sort of take a look and do the right thing, either with the dam, with the construction of homes everywhere, and not having a plan for the drainage. We are looking at long-term solutions. Uh, my government has uh, changed Australia's position on climate change. It is going to have an effect on the budget and on the bottom line. A lot of the fruit and vegetables uh, that are grown in New South Wales are grown in the Sydney Basin, so it, clearly it's going to have a massive impact. These floods uh, will uh, make the costs of some essentials, some fruit and vegetables, even more expensive. Right now here in the Hunter and Maitland area, the number one focus is keeping people safe and getting them the support they need. Our message to people is we will be there for you. People are incredibly frustrated. It's a really tough time. We have survived again. Slowly My guest this morning is the Health Minister, Mark Butler. First, though, let's check what's making news. Millions of Australians will gain access to antiviral treatments for COVID, even if they don't have an underlying medical condition. News Corp papers report everyone over 70 will be able to access the treatments. We'll hear more from Mark Butler on that shortly. In The Guardian, Labor will push to legislate campaign spending caps and truth in political advertising. 
It follows big spending in the election campaign by Clive Palmer and in some of the individual seat contests between Teal Independents and Liberals. In the Nine Papers, the Greens are pushing the government to expand the scope of its proposed anti-corruption watchdog, lowering the bar for launching investigations and even giving it the power to investigate people and businesses outside of government. And in the Sunday Telegraph, Linda Silmanis reports Andrew Constance may be lining up to fill Maurice Payne's Senate seat if the former Foreign Minister decides to leave Parliament. Constance failed to win the seat of Gilmore at the election. He was previously Transport Minister in the New South Wales Government. Now, the ministerial contact with China is a positive step. If the two sides can't talk, there's greater risk of misunderstanding and mistakes. But conversation doesn't mean capitulation. Just look at the Prime Minister's travels over the past seven weeks. Almost all of it has involved efforts to counter the rise of China by strengthening ties with the Quad, with NATO, France, Indonesia. Next stop, the Pacific. Anthony Albanese doesn't look like someone cozying up to Beijing, which has made the attempt by some in the coalition to have a crack at his travel schedule look a little odd. Let's see what the panel makes of it. We're joined this week by Karen Middleton, Claire Armstrong, and welcome to the Insider's Couch, Dan Borsha. Great to have you here. Good to be with you. Now, let's start on this meeting uh, between Penny Wong and Wang Yi. Karen, how significant was that? What was the import of this? I think it is significant. We've seen the meeting of the defence ministers, now we've seen a meeting of the foreign ministers, and I think it makes it much harder for the rhetoric to continue to escalate if we're actually having personal contact, if they're eyeballing each other. It obviously doesn't solve the problem. Australia is still saying we're not budging on the 14 demands that the Chinese put, and China is clearly still not budging on our trade demands because they refused to meet the trade had the meeting with the trade ministers. I think there was a message there that trade is still not ready to be resolved. But you've got to say that it's it's a step in the right direction to have personal contact. Well, that's, that's Penny Wong has framed this as a first step, and she was really clear about this. And she's not exactly building expectations that we will suddenly see everything smoothed out. Take a look. This is the first uh, of um, the first step towards stabilising the relationship. So. You know, we are a government and we're a nation that's made certain decisions and on the basis of our national interests, our national security and our sovereignty, and we won't be resolving from those. Uh, but uh, we do think it's uh, in our, our interests and we would say in China's interest for the relation to be stabilised. That's going to take time, it's going to take uh, effort, it's going to take work and it's going to take some nuance time, effort and nuance. Yeah, and Penny Wong is also in emphasising, and I think this is interesting, China's role with Russia and Ukraine. Mm. She's made that point very strongly, that China has influence over Russia in, in relation to Ukraine, that China is also a permanent member of the UN Security Council and has responsibilities of its own in that in that relationship there. And I think there's a message there that China has an opportunity to have a positive influence and be seen thus in the world by exerting some influence over Russia. But it's also a bit of a message that if China was to, to, to do that, it's kind of boxing China in. It won't be able to p potentially do similar things in Taiwan if it if it's engaging and trying to ease the tension between Russia and Ukraine. So it's an interesting message, I think. Well, the Prime Minister's been sending this message too. So it's a little bit of a two-track message, if you like. Good thing that the talks have happened now between the foreign ministers, but, but we still have all these concerns. Here he was. Dialogue is always a good thing. Of course, this is just a first step, and I note that uh, that uh, our foreign minister raised uh, the issues in of concern, including uh, the ongoing treatment of Cheng Li and Dr. Yang and others, uh, as well as uh, the sanctions uh, that remain in place, uh, disadvantaging. Uh, Australian economic interests. Yes, yeah, so it's the trade sanctions, Claire, the detention of those Australian citizens on spurious grounds, China's position when it comes to Russia, all of these things. Feels like we're at a really interesting juncture in the relationship, you know. Is there a path towards um, better days? Uh, or, is, or are you on this course now with all these concerns where it's going to continue to be a really hard relationship? Yeah, well, how many more first steps are there going to be? I think Richard Miles characterised his meeting with his counterpart as the first step in rebuilding that relationship. Now we've had another first step. I think there are going to be a lot more firsts to come. But speaking of, of Richard Miles, I, I remember he, he said to me after that meeting 
that diplomacy is not for allies. Diplomacy with allies is just hanging out. Diplomacy is for those difficult relationships like the one that Australia currently has yeah. with Beijing. And to talk is better than to not. But I don't think anyone is under any illusion that any of the issues that you've just raised that Karen was talking about are remotely near being resolved. Uh, and, and there doesn't seem to actually be that much will to substantively engage in a rebuild by actually um, a show of good faith, removing a trade sanction or, or dealing with some of those issues like Australians detained. I mean, it's, it's interesting because in the election campaign, of course, we saw some in the coalition going really hard on Labor. There were the Manchurian candidate claims about Richard Miles and you know, Labor's going to be soft on China. Clearly, we have not seen that in the seven weeks or so since the election. But do you think this might be weighing on Labor's mind, you know, this level of caution about how it steps, how it treads on, on the China relationship? I don't think that that domestic concern has necessarily... I mean, Labor have done on this side of the election exactly what they said they would do the previous side. I don't yeah. know that they're worried that banter and question time is going to dictate how they approach the world. I think this is just emblematic of, of where the entire uh, sort of Western world has moved in terms of its position on China. Being in, uh, in Europe for NATO last week, it was cannot be understated the significance of having powers that ordinarily are not that occupied with the Asia-Pacific kind of region, specifically calling out China in the doctrine of NATO, saying that their nuclear armament, that their treatment, the issues of human rights, their, their support of... Uh, the militarisation of the, the South China Sea, all of those issues were specifically called out. So really, I think Labor are acting in the way, not only that they said they would, but but where a lot of our allies and where the world is moving anyway. I don't think they're caught, being cautious about it just because of some coalition talking points. Well, yeah, you were following the PM at that NATO summit in Paris. He then, of course, went to Ukraine. Yeah, the NATO summit in um, Madrid and the, and the Paris meeting with Macron. He then went to Ukraine uh, and he was there while the floods started to happen around around Sydney and, and, and surrounds. Um, and there was a bit of criticism from some in the coalition that he wasn't there on the ground with the flood victims. Here it was. It is important um, that constituents know uh, that people are on the job. And uh, we hadn't heard from Anthony Albanese for 48 hours. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Uh, they're pretty quick to throw a few grenades at Scott Morrison. Uh, yes, he was on holidays, uh, but again, uh, this is coming back to the fact is, let's just get the facts out there, let's understand, but at the core of this has to be the victims. Now, this line of attack didn't particularly uh, catch fire. It fell pretty flat, it must be said. A couple of things. I mean, Anthony Albanese was in a complete blackout, right, while he was in Ukraine. <laughs> there was no phones or anything. Uh, he did talk about it and spoke to the Premier and then toured the flood zones with the Premier as soon as he could. Peter Dutton, meanwhile, the opposition leader, was on an overseas holiday himself uh, at the time. I think he still may be. Dan, what, what did you make of those... I guess, half-hearted attacks from some in the coalition. Oh, look, it seemed to me, David, that they were trying to make a, a false connection between the Prime Minister trying to repair Australia's relationship on the international stage, which ties in with so many of the stories that are in the news right now, with the holiday of the former Prime Minister mm. to Hawaii. And I think that fell fairly flat when we've heard comments from Mr Albanese talking about Australia's role and how important it is that we are at these tables having these conversations. He said he's not a government of one person, that there are other people there. And then on top of that, you had the Premier of New South Wales saying, no, the communication was actually great, let's get out there as soon as we possibly can, which I'm pretty sure was quicker than when there have been previous disasters. Yeah, and they made that point that the support started to flow um, in record time. Was some of this, Karen, driven by not so much the Hawaii holiday, but the criticism of Scott Morrison earlier this year when the floods in particularly northern New South Wales, he had COVID uh, and there was criticism that he wasn't on the ground quick enough. Was that what they were on about? Well, maybe, but, I mean, it was a bit desperate wasn't it, really? Yeah. And I don't think it went well for them because all it really did was remind people that Scott Morrison went to Hawaii on a holiday <laughs> during the bushfires, yeah. which wasn't great for them. Yeah. And I just, I just didn't think it was a smart thing to do. I thought it was a strange decision to make and it just suggests that the opposition didn't really have a lot to challenge and were desperately reaching for something I, I to think challenge. Sorry, I think Susan Lee got there a little bit toward the end of the week when she was talking about the, the, the triggering of the support payments, that they were quite quick on that top tier, the, the cheap loans or the in conjunction with the state government. Right. But it wasn't until 
the Wednesday, Thursday, I think, um, that they started moving on the $1,000 per person, um, that emergency support. And when she started talking about how that could have been triggered sooner, I think that was a far better space for them to occupy than... Where's yeah. the PM? And she, she wasn't as strong on that as, as some of the others as well. Yeah, and what does that say to us about where the coalition's at? Because I found this notable as well, that some of them didn't go there um, in the way that Angus Taylor and a couple of others did. It, 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 does Karen have a point that they just don't know quite where to attack the government at the moment? I would say so, and I would say if you looked at who did go there, it was often people that had, like, a regular weekly media spot, and right. it was almost like a question thrown out there, and it was up to them in the moment to decide how they were going to respond. I didn't get the sense that it was like, here's the talking here's the point memo. for the week, <laughs> this is what we've got to talk <laughs> okay. about. So, we yeah. should talk about the flood victims here, though, because um, you know, this, some, of, some of them have copped, I think, four... Uh, flooding events in the space of only 18 months, right, in these, these parts around Sydney in particular, it's a shocker. Um, and, you know, every time we, we have this debate around the support payments but also mitigation, and there's been debate around the Warragamba Dam and whether that should be raised, the New South Wales Government wants feds to help out with that. Are we going to have to see more um, effort on mitigation? It just seems like these... These disasters, Dan, are just coming and coming and coming. Yeah, absolutely. The key here, though, is that we can't have the conversation while we're in the disaster, and we haven't been having it when we're not in a disaster. Like, if you look at preparedness in Australia, the, the ball has been dropped. I was speaking to a vet in regional New South Wales yesterday who was saying we need to comprehensively look at our risk management system. We need to be putting more money in around risk mitigation, but also preparedness for our systems, because people are exasperated. We probably also need to have a really good look at development in flood-prone areas around our major cities, which often tend to be where those that are, are doing it toughest tend to live and who might not have insurances or might struggle with those systems as well. It's a good point because this is the conundrum. It's often the only affordable housing that people can find, but then you can't you can't insure it because the premiums are you know off the charts in those particular flood-prone areas. Yeah, and the issue of mitigation and the raising of the dam wall, I think it's important that governments look at all the options for mitigation, not just that one. Yeah. Governments, particularly the New South Wales government, seems to be sort of zeroing in on that. And there's a bit of suspicion around that that may have something to do with wanting to release more floodplain land in the future. Uh, if you've got a higher dam wall, then maybe some more land becomes available for development. But, I mean, then you're just potentially creating a greater problem should we see an even greater flood in the future. So I I think that this needs to not be looked at as a simple solution. No, to and a there, with that particular one, there are going to be environmental issues further up into the, the Blue Mountains, I think. And so there's a lot of concerns around this. But yeah. Labor did make it clear before the election, Claire, uh, that spending more on mitigation, freeing up the, mo the money that's been sitting in this fund, is something they're going to do. Yeah, restructuring that fund was one of the key sort of, uh, I guess, parts of their election commitment around disaster response. Well, a lot of what that fund was doing in terms of the, I think it's 100 million, 200 million that goes out the door every year, mm. was being Mental, spent on yeah. recovery. Um, and they are re Labor are going to restructure it so that the entirety of what is tipped out of that fund every year will be exclusively on, on, um, on mitigation, which obviously puts a lot more money on the table. But as Karen says, there are so many different issues to consider. And I think the reason that the Warragamba Dam is, is getting such a focus is, you know, if you're someone that's living in the Hawkesbury, that's brooming like you know putting the broom yeah. through your house for the yeah. fourth time in 18 months if someone if there is a solution like that that become you know no one else has put anything on the table and so that is why i That's think people are gravitating to, to it yeah no all right time to talk to the health minister now mark butler about the covid situation to take us there he was the vice president of the australian medical association chris moy on the decision to recommend a fourth vaccine dose for everyone over 50 and make it available for those over 30. For, for many people, they, they, if they're comfortable to have a very safe fourth shot, absolutely go for it. However, there is a slight issue about where we sit later if we need to go later if we get another wave or if, for example, we need to shift to an Omicron-specific vaccine. And I think there is a little bit of an issue about what the advice will be. Do we go to a fifth shot when, at the moment, there's not a lot of evidence across the world yeah. for a fifth shot? Mark Butler, welcome to the program. Thank you, David. So before we get to who should and shouldn't get a fourth vaccine dose, how worried are you about this latest COVID wave in Australia? Well, I think health authorities across the country are worried about this third Omicron wave for the year. Uh, we already have uh, about a quarter of a million people today with COVID officially and probably many 
more tens of thousands without having officially reported it or not having symptoms. There are about 4,000 people in hospital now with COVID and we're still seeing several hundred, a few hundred deaths every week uh, from COVID. So this is very serious. The, the, the unique thing about this particular wave, which is driven by two new subvariants of Omicron BA4 and BA5, is that people are getting reinfected with these new subvariants. So the fact that you had COVID earlier this year, the fact you might have only had COVID a couple of months ago, does not necessarily protect you from getting infected again. And that was the very strong advice from the Chief, Chief Health Officers just on Friday when they said that the reinfection infection period would now be shortened from 12 weeks to just four weeks. So, so if you have had COVID and four or five weeks later start to get symptoms again, you should get tested and isolate. So how serious could this get? You mentioned 4,000 <coughs> in hospital at the moment with COVID and deaths are running at about 300 a week. Mm. How bad is it going to get in the next six weeks? Well, I think across the states we expect case numbers to continue to climb for some weeks yet. We're, we're still relatively early in winter. Hospitals are still pressured by influenza as well as a range of other illnesses. So there is very real pressure on our hospital system right now and health authorities are worried that hospitalisations will climb uh, even more quickly, which is why we've acted so quickly to get those fourth doses broadened in terms of eligibility and why today I've announced a much broader access to these very effective antiviral medicines. Well tell us about that. So the antivirals have been uh, limited to those who have underlying conditions. What are you <laughs> announcing today? Well, I'm announcing today that everyone aged 70 or over will have access to these antiviral medicines. So tablets, capsules that you can take at home. Only recently, to get antiviral treatment, you had to go into hospital and have it intravenously. So now, if you are over 70, you will automatically have access to those medicines on the PBS. So probably only $6 just for, just for a, a round of that. If you're over 50, you'll have to show that you've got a couple of risk factors that make you particularly vulnerable to severe COVID, which might end you up in hospital. But if you are such a person, you should also take that advice from your GP. These are cheap medicines and they are very effective. They'll reduce the incidence of severe disease across the community and, very importantly, relieve that pressure we're now seeing build on our hospitals. Um, I assume they have a shelf life. I think the shelf life for these treatment drugs <coughs> are only about 18 months. How long until the ones we've got? And I think we've got more than 2 million um, courses of them. How long before they have to be disposed? Yeah, well, the former government ordered 1.3 million doses of these two medicines, Paxlovid and Molnupiravir, uh, and to their credit, they did. But the problem is they've been sitting in warehouses rather than getting out uh, into people actually doing their job, which is why we've made this decision. We're, we're talking with the companies now and the authorities about those shelf lives to make sure that we get the, the full benefit of the medicines that the former government ordered. And we'll have further to say about that in due course. So they might be given a longer shelf life basically. Well, that's certainly my ambition. Right. I mean, what I really want, though, is to get them out of the warehouses yep. uh, onto pharmacist shelves and into people who are at risk of severe mm. disease. And that's really the impact of the decision I've announced today, which we've fast-tracked. So on vaccines now, uh, the recommendation as of Thursday, and this will be taking effect from tomorrow, uh, mm. it's recommended the fourth dose for everyone over 50. For those over 30, though, those in their 30s and 40s, they can get a fourth jab, uh, but Atagi says the benefits are limited. Some might be confused what to do here. We know there are more variant-specific vaccines that are being looked at at the moment from Pfizer and Moderna. Should they wait for those or should they go and get the fourth jab that's there now? Well, the real driver of the fourth dose decision is to protect people who might be at risk of severe disease during this winter, this, this third Omicron wave which we've just talked about. And there's not a lot of evidence that people who don't have underlying health conditions aged 30 to 49 are at particular risk of severe disease, which is why it's a fairly soft recommendation, just really the ability, if you want a bit of a boost to your immunity and you're of that age, you can go out and get a fourth dose. My, my overriding message for that age group, though, is get your third dose. There mm. are still about 2.5 million people in their 30s and 40s who haven't got their third booster dose. That's the real kicker. That's, that's the thing that gives you a very big boost in immunity against severe disease or, or even worse. And there are still more than 5 million Australians who've had their second dose more than two, uh, six months ago but haven't yet had that crucial booster, which is why we've rolled out 
the information campaign we had, the boosters are critical. Third doses are critical. Now, if you've had that, by all means, think about a fourth dose. And if you're over 50, it's recommended you get a fourth dose because that will lift your immunity over the course of this winter. Well, just on that third dose, the figures you point out there, uh, around 5 million Australians haven't had the third dose. It's nearly a third of the eligible population. It's even worse amongst Indigenous Australians. Nearly a half uh, haven't mm. had that third dose. So what, what more can you do to get that, that third dose rate up? Well, we're trying to talk about it every chance we get, David, and we've also rolled out an information campaign that, that um, I asked my department to do as soon as I was appointed. I mean, I made a criticism of the former government before the election campaign that there just wasn't enough energy around the importance of boosters. You know, too often the message was it was almost just a nice thing to get rather than something that was critical to your protection against particularly these Omicron variants. I mean, the message from our health authorities is clear. Two doses of the vaccine is simply not enough to protect you fully against this Omicron well, if variant. It's, if, if, it's, if it's so critical, though, uh, and you know, you're right, you talked about this before the election. Before the election, you even suggested uh, a, a, an incentive payment of 300 bucks for people to get a vaccine. Why don't you come up with an idea like that that might actually shift this number, get more people uh, having that third dose? Well, we've put out an information campaign. We, we, we think that is the way to start to reinforce the importance of getting this third dose. Uh, as you say, there are particular cohorts in the population that have lower than average rates. There's, there's a, a, an information campaign particularly targeted to First Nations communities to get that rate up from about half where it is now. Although I have to say very pleasingly, it's much higher than that amongst older members of First Nations communities. We've, done, we've got to just improve awareness of, for people. Is that enough? I remember pointing um, information campaigns, I'm sure, help, but we no longer have the sort of requirement to get the third dose that we had for the second dose. Mm. Let's be honest, that's why the second dose rate is so much higher than the third dose. Of course, of course. Look, we've, we've moved to a different phase of the pandemic, David, now. We're beyond the emergency phase where you see lockdowns and mandates and emergency payments and such like. We really are at the point now where there needs to be maximum information to the community so that they can make informed decisions themselves and make sure they have available to them vaccines, including the fourth dose, medicines if they're at risk of severe disease. That is the approach, I think, deep into the third year of a pandemic. Well, you say we've moved to a new phase of the pandemic, but you just told us we're in a new wave that's very serious, we're going to see hospitalisations increase, you're worried about this. Are we really in a new phase of the pandemic where we don't need to consider some of these old measures, like mask mandates in particular? Why, why don't we look at that just for the next six weeks? Well, there's no advice uh, to me or to any of the state health ministers that we should in introduce broad-based mask mandates. The chief health officers only met in the last couple of days and there was no such advice given by them. Again, I think the broad view is that in this phase of the pandemic, mask mandates and things like that are best done in a targeted way. So there are mask mandates in aged care and health facilities, on public transport, on aeroplanes and such like. And very clear advice from the chief health officers that if you're in a crowd crowded indoor space with, with no ability to socially distance, you should give very strong consideration to wearing a mask. But that is, again, the, health you, again, that again, is you, the health advice right now, David. You only have to, you know, go to the movies or a shopping centre or the footy to see what a, what, how ineffectual a recommendation is. So many people not wearing masks. It wasn't one of the lessons of the pandemic that these things, mask mandates for a fixed period, work. Well, they do, but we're deep into the third year. They, they did work very we're well the in the first couple wave. of years. We're deep into the third year, David, and, and the health advice that we're all receiving, and it's only been issued again in the last few days, is that these sorts of mandates at this phase of the pandemic are best done in a targeted way, particularly focusing on risk of severe disease among the vulnerable population. That's the advice that we're following. Pandemic leave payments have also come to an end. You've decided not to extend them. If people are still required to isolate when they have COVID, um, unlike any other illness, you've got to isolate if you have COVID, why shouldn't they be given sick pay? Look, this emergency payment was designed by the former government and the state government, so it's a co-owned scheme, if you like, to, to come to an end on the 30th of June. And... Look, we've got a trillion dollars in debt. We have eye-watering deficits as far as the eye can see. And at some point, emergency payments of this type have to be wound up as we move into this new phase. And that's a decision former governments took and it's a decision we've decided to follow as well. But again, we're, we're, we're in this 
new wave that you've just talked about how serious it is. Um, casuals, if they get COVID, should they just isolate and you know, go without an income or should they risk turning up at work with COVID? What, what, what's your advice to them? Well, of course, uh, there are state rules to isolate and these emergency payments just simply have to be wound up at some point. And whatever but why point... now, at the start of a new wave, of a third wave? I mean, the, the ACTU, uh, some of the you know, retail and hospitality industry groups are all saying, for the safety of our workforce, you need to have a COVID uh, pandemic leave payment still in place so people do isolate. I accept that whenever you end an emergency payment of this type, it is going to impact people, and I, I deeply regret that, of course. But, but at some point, these emergency payments simply have to be wound up. We don't have the financial capacity to keep making them forever. Uh, they were intended to wind up on the 30th of June. That was the decision taken by the former government and all state governments who, who are co-signatories to that scheme, and it's a decision we've had to continue. So if things get really bad in the hospital system in the coming six weeks, you won't reconsider this or, or mask wearing or any of these things that are being phased out? Well, look, of course, uh, governments remain open to considering developments in this pandemic and we take the health advice and we are committed to making sure that we do everything possible to get through this winter safely. That's why we've acted so quickly to bring new energy to the fight against COVID, extending hospital payments to the states for three more months, $750 million. As I said, extending eligibility to vaccines, to treatments, um, a new information campaign to promote the importance of boosters, bringing Jane Holton in to commission advice about the, I guess, the fitness for purpose of our vaccine and treatment procurement arrangements. There is real energy we're bringing to this fight against COVID. OK, but just to be clear here, if someone advises you, apart from all those groups that are currently advising you, the pandemic leave payments are going to be important in the next couple of months through the winter to keep people at home who've got COVID. <coughs> Will you reconsider this? Well, look, we've said these emergency payments can't continue forever. Mm. We have an extraordinarily difficult budget position, which means hard decisions have to be made. But, of course, we will keep an eye on all of the developments in this pandemic right. and make sure the community is protected. All right, so some, some opening there is how we should read this. If things get worse, you might come back to this. Well, look, this pandemic is a fluid pandemic and it's not behind us by any means. Right. So, but we need to be honest with the Australian people. The, the budget is in a very bad position and emergency payments cannot be continued forever. The other thing you've decided not to extend are the about 70 different telehealth services that were put in place to deal with COVID. Um, doctors are, are pleading with you to reconsider this one as well, again, pointing out the pandemic isn't over. Will you reconsider any of those telehealth services? Well, some doctors are, uh, David, and some doctors have made the point that clinically it's a very good decision to put a limit on telephone consultations. Again, this was a decision taken and telegraphed by the former government many months ago. The important thing for your viewers to understand, David, is that telehealth is now a permanent feature. Uh, although it's obviously always best, if possible, to have a face-to-face -face consult with your doctor, if you need to consult with them remotely, you can still do that for short consults and for longer consults. The decision, though, is to limit telephone consults, where there's no face-to-face -face engagement at all, to consults up to 20 minutes. And the mm. clinical advice to me and to my, my former colleague, uh, Greg Hunt, was that there's good reason for that. For complex, longer consultations, that face-to-face -face engagement you get, either in person or at the very least through FaceTime or Skyping or whatever face-to-face -face video consult you do, is clinically important. That's why I've continued that decision. What if you're an older or vulnerable Australian, not so good at Skype, um, you don't have a high-speed internet connection, perhaps, um, but you want that longer consultation to find out all your conditions, whether you should get these antivirals that we were just talking about, I don't understand why you can't just do it on the phone. Well, the clinical advice has been there's, there's good reason not to do longer complex consultations without some ability to have face-to-face -face engagement. Now, six out of seven of these consultations are under 20 minutes. Yeah. That won't be impacted. You can do it over the phone or you can do it over video. But I've had some clear advice, and my, my, my predecessor had the same advice, that there's good reason to require face-to-face -face engagement for consults over 20 minutes. And there's been substantial notice given to doctors about this. Uh, there really has been substantial notice. All right. Health Minister Mark Butler, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, David. Well, let's return to our panel. We're joined once again by Karen Middleton, Dan Borsha, Claire Armstrong. Let's just <coughs> talk a little bit about where we're at with COVID. Um, clearly, we're at the beginning of a 
concerning uh, new Omicron wave and the next six weeks or so are going to be uh, a point of pressure for the, for the hospital system. Karen, it does sound like they're doing some measures, getting that fourth dose more widely available, the antiviral treatments as yep. well, and Claire, you wrote about this today too. Yep. But things like the pandemic leave payment, does it make sense that that's come to an end? Well, it's a difficult choice, isn't it? I understand the argument they're making, but also if you're in that situation where you're staying home, I, I just had COVID recently, I had mm. to stay home, I did get paid because I get sick leave. But, if I, but if I was a casual employee, what would I have done? I have to stay home. And in fact, I ended up with almost two weeks off because I was crook. So, um, you know, you can understand that's a pretty tough situation. You do wonder whether there's a halfway point somewhere where you might do something for, at least for those particular casual workers, but he seemed unmoved on that point. Yeah, I mean, what, do you, what do you guys think? I mean, it seems to me that as long as we have this um, isolation requirement, unlike any other illness, as I said, that, that support payment should probably be there, shouldn't it, until that comes to an end? Well, you're breaking the law if you go out. Um, Correct. You should be in isolation. And if that's the case, then there needs to be some kind of compensation or support there to ensure that people don't break the law because, of course, the risk we have now is that a lot of people will do their at-home rat test, see the two lines and think, well, I can't afford that right now, mm. which obviously fuels the pandemic, the opposite of what we want to see happening. Or, or worse, won't do rat tests at all and, and won't go down that route of even checking if you do have COVID-19 because the risk and the, and the personal cost will be too high. Mm. And the knock-on effects in the economy. Where, yes, there's a budget cost of this leave payment, but having more COVID in the community, I mean, you know, you're seeing the knock-on effects through the workforce everywhere you go at the moment, right? To me, this issue of trying to keep people who we know are sick at home um, probably is more significant even then. I know there's always this talk about whether we bring back masks or have mandates on, on boosters and things, but when we know someone is sick and are a confirmed risk to the community, anything we can do to mitigate that risk is always going to, in my mind, in this pandemic, be the priority because... I mean, you can talk about mandates for other things, but compliance, even when you're on a plane these days where masks still are compulsory, every second passenger has their mask around their chin. It's, you know, it's, we're, we're at a point in the pandemic where I think mandating those kinds of mitigation strategies are just not as effective. But the one thing we could absolutely make a difference on is keeping sick people at home. I think on the mask mandate point, it's, it's interesting. The government is obviously super reluctant to reintroduce them beyond those particularly yeah. vulnerable areas. State and federal. Yeah, and I think the issue there is that people may not comply anymore. They're, they're, they're over it. And that's a problem. It's clear that masks make a difference. It's clear you should be wearing a mask as often as possible in, in public places because it stops you getting sick and it stops you infecting others when you don't know that you've got this virus. People maybe, are, are, you know, they're obviously encouraging people to do this voluntarily, but, but they're concerned clearly that if they mandate it, there'll be a, you know, a pushback and it may not work and it may cause other unhappiness and other unrest. The, the antivirals, though, um, this is something Mark Butler had been pushing the, the PABC to, PBAC to, um, to move on. We've got plenty of it sitting there on the shelf, not barely any of it getting into people's arms. So this should make some difference, particularly for the older cohort. Yeah, I think his characterisation that we've got all of these um, and the two that he's approved are oral antivirals uh, sitting on in a warehouse is a little disingenuous because obviously they are distributed as per like GP advice, mm. the previous rules. But they're sitting on someone's shelf, they're, is, they're, is the point. But they, were si they weren't sitting there because necessarily people that needed them under the, the, the health guidelines that were developed mm. at the time and the approvals that were developed at the time weren't being implemented. Yeah. Um, what this really does is really lower the threshold. So the main thing is it, it reduces reduces the need to have a underlying factor like diabetes, asthma, uh, obesity before you can access it. So it will, pro it will undoubtedly see, a lot. I think, a lot of people preventatively taking the antiviral in the first couple of days of being infected, mm. which hopefully will have that flow-on effect because we do have, I think, 4,000 people roughly in Australia in hospital at the moment with COVID. Mm. A couple of other things uh, this week. Attorney General Mark Dreyfus ordered an end to the prosecution of uh, Canberra lawyer Bernard Caleri, former ACT Attorney General, um, over his role in exposing the alleged Australian bugging of East Timor back in 2004 during oil and gas negotiations. Um, here was Mark Dreyfus. Having regard to our national security, our national interest and the proper administration of justice, today I have determined that this prosecution should end. 
My decision was informed by the government's commitment to Australia's national security and our relations with our neighbours. Yeah, an interesting point there. The Commonwealth DPP had previously said uh, this prosecution was in the public interest and warranted. Mark Dreyfus, we heard there, says he's ordered an end to it because of the national interest and relations with our neighbours. Dan, why has he done this? Well, it strikes me that it, this is about a couple of things. It's removing barnacles that have been hanging around for successive governments now, but also shoring up relations with Timor-Leste, which is clearly uh, not just that relationship, but global relationships is something that's very important to this government and getting us on a surer footing there. I think the big question now becomes what about those other people that are, are tied in and connected uh, with these sort of laws uh, and what about the bigger question around the reforms or reviews of whistleblower legislation to ensure that this doesn't happen again? Well Mark Dreyfus said this was an exceptional case so Karen I, I suppose he's not wanting to allow this to become a precedent for no, other whistleblowing cases. He's not because there are a couple of other cases on the books that uh, he doesn't want to, to automatically have this connected to um, but I think Dan's right there's a question about how effective and how well how effective whistleblowing legislation is and whether it works well enough because I mean let's let's look look at this case what was the greater transgression the leaking of the fact that Australia spied on a friendly neighbour in order to advance its commercial interests one of the poorest or the act of spying on a neighbour to advance our commercial interests is that what our spies are meant to be for. I would argue that was the act of spying that was the greater transgression that in fact making this known is in the public interest. Um, maybe I would say that as a journalist but I actually think <laughs> that that's the case. And then you go one step beyond this, this guy Bernard Caleri, he was the lawyer yeah. of, of the person accused of, of leaking. So you know there was a particular case here. Uh, there are obviously other cases on foot and the government's made it clear it wants to deal with each thing separately. Whether it does go to those other two cases or not, I don't know. Look, yeah, and look, many journalists, uh, human rights advocates, East Timor's president have all celebrated this decision. The opposition, uh, the Shadow Attorney General Julian Lisa, has called it a dangerous move. Um, but uh, Claire, this was a pretty extraordinary case, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the coalition had to defend its legacy here and, and it, they, they were never going to suddenly welcome something that was in direct contradiction to the decisions they'd made while in government. Um, but, you, but you are right, this case in particular, just even, you know, obviously not even having my journalist hat on to the layman was clearly in the public interest and the fact that that's been upheld by Dreyfus. I mean, think I speak speaks volumes. The real issue I, I find is that obviously this was done through ministerial discretion, and he's effectively then extended that by saying, "I use my discretion to say this is not a precedent." Yeah, <laughs> Which it, it, I don't think this this um, discretion has been used before. This is an unprecedented move. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think you might be right. But um, but I think um, it's important to note that the when with the Commonwealth DPP having made the decision to prosecute was with the approval of the previous Attorney General Christian couldn't Porter. have done that without the approval of the previous That's Attorney right. General. So it, it wasn't separate from the Attorney General. The government made a decision to prosecute. So to say it's just the DPP's decision isn't quite right. Now, it's also uh, today, I think, marks the end of NAIDOC week. Uh, Dan, what has NAIDOC, actually, NAIDOC week actually been celebrating this week? Before we get into some of the debates around the voice to Parliament, what's been, what's been the highlight of this week? Oh, I think it's about that point of celebration, David, I don't know about you, but every social media feed I have is celebrating black excellence and particularly a nod to the elders. And I want to acknowledge that we're here on the lands of the Kulin Nation. And that's certainly been a part of this big conversation this week. Also about that being brave and standing up and having difficult conversations in a way that include all of us, because that's the only way that we can ultimately deal with the, the big issues that we're grappling with. And you've been engaged in some of these difficult conversations this week that uh, have really centred around where to now on uh, the voice to Parliament, right? Because we know um, Anthony Albanese has made it very clear at the outset that this is a priority for him. But now we're getting into some of the difficult debates. You spoke to uh, Pat Anderson, one of the architects and leaders of the Uluru Statement, um, who, well, we'll play a bit of it here, makes the point about how much detail needs to be sorted out before we have a referendum on a voice to Parliament. Take a look. You can't put the whole act or the bill in the Constitution, just two or three very simple sentences which calls for um, a First Nations voice to be enshrined in the Constitution, which give us a, 
gives that protection we haven't had before. And then all the detail will be done by legislation. So, Dan, tell us about what the debate looks like at the moment on this, this issue of how much detail around the voice, how it's elected or appointed or what it does, what it doesn't do, how much of that needs to be settled before we have a referendum? I think this is one of the key questions and Aluar Elder Ani Pat there was making a clear distinction that this is perhaps going to be two discussions. On one hand we have what is the sequence of words that goes into the constitution or that goes to the people to vote if it will go into the constitution and then separately what does that enable us to the parliament to create? Because, and Ani Pat described that as more enabling legislation. So very simple words that, that give rise to a voice but don't embed any detail. And then you give that to the parliament to say, right, now get on with it and design something that is fit for purpose, that can be changed from time to time, but must be there. Will those, Karen, who oppose uh, a voice to parliament, and I suspect there will be some, will they um, seize upon anything that's too broad or not detailed uh, to, to mount their argument that we shouldn't vote for something if we don't know the detail? I think they will argue, if they don't want it to go ahead, they will argue that point. If it's too general, they'll say it's too general, we don't know exactly what we're voting for. Mm. But if it's specific, they'll seize on the specifics and say this isn't the version we want. So either way. So those people are not going to go, oh, OK, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. If, they're, if they're entrenched against it. And we, history shows us, I think, when we look back at the Republic referendum, that that was a model that was not popular and, in in fact, you might argue that certain people steered it in that direction to ensure it was a model that mm. wasn't popular and wasn't going to get up. And that set back the cause of an Australian Republic by more than two decades. So yeah, I think there's an argument that, the, that too much detail not only um, potentially ties down uh, parliaments into the future in terms of the constitution, but potentially derails things at a very early stage. And that, that there seems to be a growing argument that you should be more general and ask the general question, do you agree with trenching, entrenching a voice in the constitution? And then we have elected representatives to make the, make the decisions, have the arguments, design the model. I think that's potentially a way forward. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to have a referendum question on the ballot paper that has, you know, um, fine detail all spelled out but inevitably with a new body like this it is going to require you know, evolution over time isn't it into, into how practically it works yeah I think the issue is going to be not going to a ref we know that referendums are more likely to be unsuccessful than not um, history has shown yep. us finding that balance between having enough structural detail there to be able to explain to what are millions of Australians who probably haven't even turned their mind to the concept or idea of a voice so that they when they go into the ballot box to have that vote have a concept of what it will look like they're not um, you know over informed or under informed F having an ability to say this is broadly the scope and mm. then vote on it I think is the only way that you'll you'll get this past the public they're obviously huge um, a huge amount of the community who fully support getting the, that done and the detail later, but the cost could be that it doesn't pass. And I think that is what Anthony Albanese is weighing up. I was in, um, you know, we talked about before, I was in Paris. He actually opened a gallery, uh, an exhibition for Sally Gabori, who's an Indigenous yeah. artist. And at the end of his speech, he made this really um, quite... Like, it was heart-wrenching pitch for, like, it will be done. We put in the Constitution, I vow that we'll get it done. And it was quite incredible to be on the world stage, effectively, and have him put this as such a priority. And I think it speaks to the importance, you know. People, w w my family is, is it, on my mother-in-law's side, is a... Is a uh, descendant of the stolen generation and I think I see the generational trauma in my everyday life but not all Australians do mm. and I think that it's important that they have that balance to give Australians the confidence to know what this is going to look like so they go and vote for it because unfortunately not everyone does have that understanding of, of what this means for Indigenous it, Australians. And it needs to be explained as being for the betterment of the whole nation, of all of us. It gives those of us who are non-Indigenous a stake and an investment in going forward 
as a better country. It's yeah. not just about one part of the population. It's about the whole population, being a whole country. And we've seen the progression of this issue, I think, over the last couple of decades in particular, where gradually the rest of the country does have a stake. We now acknowledge traditional owners regularly. We understand mm. the impact of these things. We all saw the apology, participated, and I think most of us celebrated the national apology. So we already are seeing ourselves having a stake, and I think this, this goes another step towards the whole country having a stake, and that's how it needs to be explained. And, and Dan, this detail debate um, also ties into the timing debate and there's been a bit of uh, discussion this week around when is going to be best to hold a referendum. Where's that at? Well the, the calls from Arnie Patton and others have been that it should be the 27th of May next year which will be 56 years since the most successful referendum in Australian history to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and count them and all of us as Australian citizens. I think it's imp there's a couple of things to pick up on. That there, so there have been 44 constitutions, only eight have been successful. The ones that have been most successful have been really clear-cut and, and I worry about mm. um, the point Claire made about the, putting too much structure embedded at the front end and then not allowing the parliament to do the work later on. But picking up what Karen had to say, the Uluru Statement was an invitation to all Australians to come to the table, to be a part of this conversation. Margot Neal, the boss of Indigenous at the National Gallery, says the Indigenous story didn't end in 1788 and the Australian story didn't start in 1788. They're threads of the same rope that we're now part of this what is contemporary and modern Australia. And having these big conversations is really crucial to that. The date is going to be a really challenging one because that's, what, 10, 11 months away. I'm not sure how, how it can be ha happen in a legal sense at, with that kind of time frame. And I think the other question will be around the funding for the, the no case because... This is a good point, right, because normally with a referendum you have funding for a yes and a no case, even split public funding, that is. I mean, they can all go and do their own private fundraising. but. Um, what's the debate on that at the moment? Well, I, I think that there's a sense that if you put uh, equal funding for a no case, that you're essentially creating a case where there might not be one. So there will certainly be Australians who don't think this is a good idea, who don't want this. Pat Dodson, the Senator and, and Special Envoy on this, says this is his opportunity. His job is to get to talk to them and to have this big yarn together. The other uh, groups tend to be wanting to talk about sovereignty, about treaty, which is built in, uh, baked into some of the conversations about the Uluru Statement, so that this doesn't necessarily mitigate or, or destroy mm. that or damage that discussion later down the track. And the other point to consider, of course, is constitutional conservatives who are very worried about the sequence of words and that that might become a bit of a lawyer's picnic down the track. They don't want that. They don't want unintended consequences, I think was the term Julian Lisa used. Yeah, just, just very quickly, Karen, May next year for a referendum, too ambitious or do you think that might be possible? Well, you know, there's two arguments. If you, if you keep on putting it off, then you're just always finding a reason to put it off and the government has said they will do it in the first term and really, realistically, that really only gives them a year and a half, year yeah. or so. Otherwise, we're getting towards the next election. Uh, but if you push it too quickly and, that, and those explanations that we talked about before have not been made, then people go, oh, no, I'm not going to vote for it. So you want it to be put at a time when it's when there's enough understanding that it will succeed and not fail because that then puts it off into the never never but you don't want it to be putting putting it off now it's a hard decision yeah, thread that needle but yeah. i think the government has committed to the to this term of office and that means next year or very early the year after all right our panel karen middleton darren borsha uh, dan borsha and claire armstrong will be back shortly with some final observations time now for mike bowers talking pictures Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with cartoonist for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, the one and only Kathy Wilcox. And a very warm welcome. We both had COVID at the same time almost. Yes, yes, we've both been poor sick people, well, haven't we? Poor us. Poor us. Kathy, the Albanese government hasn't even been in power for two months, but it's already discussing underwater matters. And, uh, and Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, turned up with the New South Wales Premier, Dominic Perrottet. It was kind of nice to see them both together, right? Leaders behaving 
like leaders and mm. like adults. You can feel the visceral anger that, that this has come on them again so quickly mm. and something needs to be done about mm. it. And it's, I know, you know, here we are wiping down our mouldy shoes, yeah. going, well, that's all we've got to deal with. Yeah. You know, it just, it just would be unbelievable, wouldn't it? Cathy, I did love this cartoon. All roads seem to uh, head to net zero. Look, I had a, a, a friend a long, long, long time ago who used to say, if you want to go to Maroubra, you get on the bus that says Maroubra. Yeah. You don't get on the bus that says City or, you know, uh, Pagewood or something like that. This was not just literal, this was metaphorical. <laughs> and I still feel that if you want to get to net zero, it's best to go the road to net zero. How about we go a bit further down that road and see if it doesn't eventually bring us back to net zero. And There's, that's the uh, uh, yes. more fossil fuels way. I'm known for drawing people recognisably from the backs of their heads. You can fi figure out who these people are. Uh, lovely John Kanelka. He's got uh, the Prime Minister here uh, um, paddling his canoe. Yeah. Uh, a 43% carbon reduction target looks less inadequate if you imagine it is a floor rather than the ceiling. And uh, we're more about the roof these days. Yes. <laughs> Like Family sitting on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are so grim, these cartoons. Like, yeah. there's, there's a grimness to the whole I thing. I know, I know. I've never had to use so much grey and brown. Lovely Glen Leave cartoon with um, the Sydney Swampera House, half submerged here and a uh, little coal on top with a uh, little fire crown. He manages to say so much with so few words. Cathy, the Prime Minister left a long campaign here at home to go and tour an actual war zone. Um, he uh, travelled to uh, Kiev and met uh, with uh, President Zelensky. It was quite jarring photos to see him actually there, right? Mm, mm. That would uh, bring a bit of perspective, wouldn't it? Yeah. On your, you know, your sense of what was, what was important and urgent business. That's right. Cathy, you've touched on this. It's a, quite a thing for the opposition to be claiming that uh, Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, is away too much when he's working, uh, when your own leader is on holidays. Look, far be it for me to do cartoons defending the government, but when the opposition comes out with this, this kind of lame shot trying to suggest that, that somehow Elbow was, was having a lark, apart from a very small um, radio audience that I know of, not very many people were buying it. You've got um, Angus Taylor here yeah. on the uh, TV. Look at Albo gallivanting around the globe while we have problems here at home. To be fair, we had to put out your diplomatic fires abroad before coming home to clean up your climate mess. Cathy, it's been a great pleasure unpicking the events this week. I'll let you do the honours. OK, and it's back to you, David Spears. Cathy, Mike, thank you very much. Let's get some final observations. Uh, Claire, to you first. PM is off to the Pacific Island Forum this week. That will be, I think, almost more important than rubbing shoulders with Boris Johnson and, and Joe Biden in terms of our relationships with countries we need to work toward our security goals in the Pacific and, and just on travel as well. I've, I'm told that the PM's not sure what's happening with the, the funeral of uh, Shinzo Abe, um, but probably... There might be a consideration that Tony Abbott goes um, on Australia's behalf. Yes, I've heard similar. Dan. Uh, get up, stand up, show up was the theme for NAIDOC week this year. That, along with the Uluru statement from the heart, are an invitation and a challenge for all Australians. So I say, if you haven't got Indigenous voices at your tables in your organisation, why not? And what are you doing to make that change? And also find out. You're still informing yourself about this big conversation. Very good. Karen? Interesting and I think important idea put this week to have a wellbeing statement in the federal budget. Mm -hmm. The question, I guess, is how we measure it and whose wellbeing. Is it just generically the whole community or spe specific vulnerable groups? And if you look at that in the context of Dr Anne Summers' work on family violence this week, where she found that a significant proportion of women were staying in violent relationships mm -hmm. because they couldn't afford to leave and were heavily dependent on government payments, maybe there's an argument for looking at the way government payments intersect with the real world. Are they making things better or in some cases making them worse. Thank you all. A great discussion this morning. A quick plug for our podcast, Insiders Back to You. It's your chance to join the conversation and raise the issues that matter to you. We'll try to tackle your questions, send them in via the ABC Listen app or by email, back to you podcast at abc.net.au. It's in your feed every Friday. Now, finally, political crisis turned to high farce in London this week. After nearly 60 MPs quit and eventually Prime Minister Boris Johnson got the message and announced that he'd go too. As one Tory MP tried to explain what was going on, a protester with a loudspeaker captured the mood with an appropriate soundtrack. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching.
uh, and obviously uh, we need to make sure we make, make the correct choice, uh, but we should do it in a reasonably quick time. In terms of Boris staying on, the convention is that the outgoing Prime Minister um, does carry on. Uh, that's what happened when uh, Theresa May left office, is what happened when David Cameron left office. You're making us all feel very